Hello, and welcome to Kafisi Connect podcast, a podcast dedicated to connecting you to influential leaders in Africa. My name is Sony, and I'm going to be the guest host for this episode today. This month, we celebrate World Earth Day, which is on Friday, April 22nd, and this year's theme is investing in your planet to highlight ways which we can help solve the climate crisis and ways to restore nature for our children and for generations after them. Who better to talk to than to climate activist Elizabeth Wadhuti? Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Um, you made headlines around the world following your impassioned speech at the opening ceremony of the World Leader Summit at COP26. And you described issues around climate change and how it's affecting people here in Kenya and also on the continent. I wanted to know, first of all, uh, with this incredible speech that went viral, how did it feel being up on that stage? I would say it was a huge responsibility being up there, knowing that you have to be a voice for the African continent and a voice for people who were not able to be there at the COP and yet they're the ones who are most affected by the climate crisis. So definitely I took it as a huge responsibility, but also before even being up on that stage, it was about what message am I going to take to the world leaders? What words are going to move them? What different thing can I say to get them to take action, to really listen to the people who are on the front line and also acknowledge their sufferings and then decide to take action? I would say this was a really heavy thing to do because also the message was heartfelt. I needed to appeal to their hearts and also at the same time, I needed to bring the people who are not present at the COP into the room through that speech. And definitely it was something that I really would say was not very easy to do, but I'm glad that I was that voice. Yeah, it was an incredibly moving speech, six minutes long. It's on YouTube. I recommend you check it out. And one thing that really stood out to me and kind of like you're mentioning is you continually ask the audience to keep an open heart and to have the grace to fully listen. And you kind of kept coming back to that statement. And I think that was really special because there can be a little a little bit of fatigue, I feel like, in, around the conversation of climate crisis, right? This is not new information to us, yet somehow we're still here in crisis. And had some interesting statistics in your speech, which I'm just going to throw back to you now. You said uh, by 2025, half of the world's pop- population will face water scarcity, that sub-Saharan Africans are responsible for just half a percent of historical emissions, yet children are responsible for none and will bear the brunt. That was incredibly moving. And truly a part of the speech that made me well up was when you had a moment of silence for the billions of people who are not with us today due to this climate crisis. So I, I think for me, I want to know, yeah, what, why was it that you wanted that open heart and, as you put it, the grace to fully listen? I think it would be interesting to mention that I only had three minutes on stage, but I ended up taking six minutes and 15 seconds. Yes. Okay. Because I wanted my message to sink in. So I kept pausing at points when I wanted people to really listen and find it in themselves to understand and feel the sufferings that are happening at the moment because I strongly feel that the world is also facing the crisis of listening and the crisis of feeling because we are privileged by the fact that we have the benefits of today's science. But even with the benefits of today's science of how our human actions are impacting the planet and also the link between planetary health and the climate crisis and all these challenges that we are facing today, We still find ourselves right now at the top of a triple planetary crisis of the nature crisis, the climate crisis and the pollution crisis and all these things are interconnected. So it's that point in time when we ask ourselves how is it possible that we find ourselves in this place and in this situation and yet we have all the information that we need, we have all the science, we have everything that we need right now to take the needed action. So It's because we are not listening and it's because that we are not feeling and acknowledging the sufferings and not just the sufferings, but the sufferings of people who are on the front line, people that don't often get the platforms to come and also share their side of the stories. And this is a challenge because this is what is delaying action because people are waiting for, you know, other people to take action. People have left this work to environmentalists, to activists, to people who believe that things need to change. But again, people in power have got all the capacity, they have all the resources that they need to step up and take action. 
but still even while demanding for this action we still don't see it happening because we have to get back to ourselves and there's something i said in the speech that the ability to care has to come from deep within ourselves you know i might tell the leaders everything that i said in that speech but that ability and the will to act has to come from deep within as humans it has to come from deep within we have to feel it in our hearts and acknowledge the sufferings of people who are facing the impacts of climate change and then also acknowledge the fact that every decision that is being made today is going to greatly impact generations to come it's the young people and the children that will live longer with the consequences of the inactions of the world leaders today and the wrong actions that we decide to take right now absolutely and i think you're right you know we have all the facts in front of us and it really is about having empathy and feeling it like you said because otherwise it's just just in air quotes numbers on a paper um and instilling that from a young age is incredibly important and i know that you started campaigning for the environment at a very young age younger than most of us just at the age of 7 you said that's when you planted your first tree um so what sparked that commitment and interest in green initiatives what sparked my activism and the fact that I'm an environmentalist is the fact that I have always loved nature ever since I was a little girl and especially because I grew up in the most forested region in Kenya and I always like to mention some of my memories as a child was the fact that I could see trees ahead of me the bushes besides me the clean streams and the rivers that were flowing just close to home and all these things and that experience of you know picking and you know of chasing butterflies as a child everything that really makes a child love and connect to nature is what really made me love and connect to nature as well and also in the process i began to also feel the pain of nature i would say because when you love something and you're connected to something i do strongly believe that you will protect it and you will feel the pain so that natural world that my friends and i knew as children also began to change before my eyes the streams that were flowing so fast were no longer flowing in the same fast speed and the water levels were going down people were cutting down trees and i could also get angry seeing people throwing trash out of car windows and so i thought to myself then this connection has got everything to do with how i feel about how people are treating nature because if you are not connected to nature if you do not love nature you're just going to be at peace and you will not realize that nature is in a crisis you not realize that our actions are impacting nature negatively and in the process we are harming ourselves because we depend on nature for our own survival so that is how it all started but also i did learn how to turn my reactions and my anger and frustrations from seeing how humans are treating nature like the example of giving up people cutting down trees and throwing trash out of car windows i learned how to turn those reactions into action i learned how to turn my anger into a hunger to want to do something about challenges like deforestation and the climate crisis and that's when i also began to engage actively on conservation matters and in the process ended up founding the green generation initiative to get children to follow in the same line and to love nature and to connect to nature. Right, and we were talking a little bit about how um children will model behavior. You know, you need to have these role models around in order to kind of follow in their footsteps. And did you have any inspiration or anybody who you looked up to at when you were 7 and when you were starting to kind of get this interest in environmentalism? Definitely. I was greatly inspired by the late Professor Ngari Mathai. And when I was 7, she was the member of parliament in my home region. and i remember she was mobilizing women to start up tree nurseries and grow trees in their farmlands and right now if you've been to nyeri county you will realize that there are so many trees that would make you think that you're in the forest but those are people's farms they really invested in growing trees around their farms and so i think she really did so much great work in sensitizing the people to grow trees around their farms as well and one thing that i ever wanted as a child was to meet professor ngari mathai and plant a tree with her just shake her hand and just also understand where she draws her strength from mm-hmm. and she really inspired me a lot because she was an african woman fighting to protect the environment at a time when african women were not even allowed to speak or challenge leadership mm-hmm. but she stood her ground and i remember as a child also it's the same time that she won the nobel peace prize and i thought to myself wow her efforts are paying off and people need to realize that what she's saying is 
really important and people need to also get involved and get behind her and we all need to like fight together so unfortunately i did not get to meet professor ngara mathai physically because she passed on when i was in form 3 mm. but even when i was in my high school i remember telling my grandmother and my mom that i want to meet professor ngara mathai but what they always told me is that if you ever want to meet professor ngara mathai that much you have to study hard just like she did right. because she was really an influential person she was the first woman in eastern central africa to earn a doctorate degree so if you want to meet her you have to really study hard just like she did and that was my motivation to study in high school so actually when i went in high school for my first year i revived environmental club that's in mm-hmm. kamburi girls high school in nyeri and we started growing trees in the farmlands and the whole time i'm really looking forward to meeting prof so what happened is even though i did not meet her i really began to find ways of how I could draw inspirations from her and I started looking for anything written about her her books magazines and that's when I came across Unbowed which happens mm-hmm. to be my favorite book up to date and when I was reading that book I keep reading it over and over again and I've read it about six times wow. now it's a great inspiration and I mean anyone who has not read that book I would recommend that book because it's as if prof is speaking to you and sharing her journey the challenges she went through and what she really stood for and what and where she was drawing her strength so then that's really i would say one of the things that keeps me going just understanding her journey and what she did and how she overcame all the odds and the fact that she was a courageous leader which Very. i think every activist should be absolutely and uh you mentioned uh being in a club in primary school starting a environmentalist club in high school and i know that you were also a member of a environmentalist club in university and it sounds like that gave you a little bit of inspiration for the green generation initiative which you started in 2016 uh and maybe you can share a little bit about it and what exactly the initiative does yes when i was founding the green generation initiative i was in second year at kenyatta university studying environmental studies and community development that's really impressive and this was actually out of passion i really wanted to be an environmentalist and i was mentioning to you that in high school people were being asked what they want to become when they grow up and i was one of the people who said i want to be an environmentalist and I did not understand much about being an environmentalist. My friends and classmates also did not understand much and someone would ask you you just want to go and plant trees and how are you going to earn your living when you're an environmentalist? <laughs> and yeah. all these questions were being asked but I strongly knew that I wanted to do something for the planet, something for nature, something that would end up saving humanity because there was a link between humans and how we're treating nature and seeing that connection so at this time i was also the vice chairperson of the Kenyatta University Environmental Club mm-hmm. because it's one of the spaces that i joined when i got into campus to connect with more people and to get that exposure to get involved in other activities on conservation because i was also trying to learn uh, things and understand what was happening around me and that's when i also discovered that the challenges around how we treat nature and the climate crisis were beyond the Kenyan borders were beyond my community it was also about how people in other countries were treating the environment how people in other countries were causing the climate crisis as well and the fact that africa as a continent contributes to less than 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions and so getting all this information is what made me realize that i actually need to use my voice to influence how others are also responding to the climate crisis in addition to doing some projects with my community on nature based solutions so In 2016 I founded the Green Generation Initiative to nurture young people to love nature and to be environmentally conscious and this is because I strongly believe that attitudes and behaviors begin to change at a young age Absolutely. and if we begin to get our children to love nature and to appreciate nature right now then we're going to make a really huge difference at the moment not just within themselves but also within the people that they influence around them and their communities and their schools as well so how exactly does the initiative have impact children now so one of the things we started to do 
was to make sure that the children are getting experiential learning, that they are not only being told about the climate crisis and about environmental challenges, but also they understand that they have a solution to play and then involving them directly in part of the, as being part of the solutions. And one of the campaigns that I started was dubbed Adopt a Tree Campaign to get every child in every school in Kenya to plant and adopt a tree each in their school compound. And what this would mean is the fact that these children would co-create with nature because a tree is life. And many people plant trees but forget that that tree needs to be nurtured to grow up to maturity. And being able to see the process of that tree from a tiny seed to a, uh, to a, a, a bigger tree and then to a huge tree eventually is what would make every child to love and appreciate nature. And so we started this process, and I remember the first school that we went to, we actually did not have as many seedlings. We had about 20 seedlings for the first school, and when we got there and realized how these children really loved the exercise, they all wanted to have a tree, but we did not have enough for them. Mm. And that's when the idea of how about we get every child to plant and adopt a tree each in the school compound because they were really loving it. You could see that they are passionate about what they're doing. And in the process, we also began to expose them to other challenges like pollution. And I remember there's a school that we took children to the nearest stream just close to the school compounds that was really polluted. Mm -hmm. And up to date, I remember the two questions that I got from the children. And one was, who did this? And the second question they asked me was, what can we do about this? Wow. It tells you that they are willing to not just be victims of the climate crisis. They are willing to not just sit back and be the most impacted, but they have chosen to step up and do something to yeah. address these challenges. And that's a rare question that you can get from a world leader. Yeah. So if we're getting these questions from the little ones who have nothing to do with the climate crisis, it tells us that we need to step up and do much more. We who have the capacity and the resources to do so much. And so this initiative then is something that we thought would continue to nurture these children. But also in the process, we realized that the children that we are working with are also impacted by climate change. They are impacted by food insecurity. Because especially for the public schools, I remember at some point we asked the children that we were training to take a lunch break and we realized that some of them did not go for the lunch break and so mm. we kept asking ourselves why didn't they not go for the lunch break and it turns out that some of them had not brought food for them to eat that day so it tells us that the children still are the most impacted and so we thought to ourselves how can we make this initiative support and provide something nutritious for them to feed at the end of the day so we started establishing food forest where we pick designated corners in the school compound and plant mixed species of fruit trees. And that would mean that this would help in supplementing the school's feeding program. Right. And also it's something nutritious and it's in and out of seasons because these are mixed species of fruit trees that would end up supporting these children. And But also the biggest challenge as well is the fact that while we do this work with the children, and so far we've been able to grow over 30,000 tree seedlings, and we've impacted over 20,000 school children, and this is through the process of nurturing them and training them, and we are at a stage where we are scaling up the initiative to be able to reach out to more children and set up more initiatives. And one of the recent ones that we've done is a green school model, which is like an eco projects demonstration corner where we fence out of space in the school compound. And in there, we have different aspects such as a kitchen garden, a small park, a food forest as well, and a mini tree nursery. And all these things all together, including a waste management corner, are in a way that the children can use that as a learning facility. And also it can help in helping the, the, the school environment to be conducive for them to learn. That is, sounds like incredible work, and yeah. you're doing so much within this initiative, which is really impressive. And I, you know, I totally agree with you that starting with children who are young, impressionable, eager to learn, it sounds like, that uh, it's a great place to start, even though unfortunately they're just kind of inheriting this crisis that we're leaving with them. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could give three small steps that businesses can take um, to improve their green credentials and, you know, uh, improve their way of working? Great. There's so many things that businesses can do. And 
as I highlight this, it's important to note that every sector can contribute to helping us respond to the climate crisis because also every sector in one or another contributes to the climate crisis. So if we need solutions, everybody can be on board and everyone has to contribute. And we also have to make sure that it's about system change and individual responsibility at the same time and not leaving the work to certain people or a certain group of people who are concerned. So well, that, that's a good point. Maybe yeah. a better question is, yeah. uh, what are three low-hanging fruits, if you will, that individuals can take in their daily lives to reduce their carbon footprint or to help their environment? Definitely. So I would say it's about the choices that we make. We are the consumers and also we are the people whose actions every day end up affecting the planet in one way or another. And I just mentioned one of the ways in which I, as an individual, am working to help the planet and also help ourselves in the process, and that's by growing trees Mm -hmm. and not just planting. And also, I did mention a lot about the fact that we are also in a pollution crisis. And this crisis, while it's contributed by bigger businesses and big corporations, also as individuals, we, in a way, contribute to this through our individual actions. So how can we make sure that we give up plastics in terms of uh, our daily consumptions and also make sure that we are not just littering anywhere? And secondly, we can take a role in educating people. So many people around us still need to be informed about how our actions today impact the planet. And second, we, I think we can also volunteer in activities and initiatives that are right now helping protect the planet. And also we can invest in the planet as well because how we invest today and where we put our money also determines how we are impacting the planet. So if we can directly support initiatives that really work on protecting the environment, then that would be one way in which we can also greatly contribute. Yeah, and I would also advise that people take up one challenge that surrounds them and then pick a solution on their end to be able to address it. Because one of the reasons why I started growing trees was because I greatly identified with my forest landscape and I realized a lot about deforestation. And I thought to myself, one of the most immediate action that I could take was to start growing trees and in the process educate the children and the people around me about the challenges. So if we can pick a challenge that surrounds us, every community has got a challenge at the moment. Mm -hmm. If everyone picks the challenge that they see, identify with it, and then not choose to just remain with the fact that there's a challenge or choose to complain about the challenge, but they would step up and do something right now to address that challenge. And then we all need to use our voices because while we do all these works on individual responsibility, we are stuck in a system where the political and economic system is working against everyone right now. trying to make a difference because while we for example may be growing trees on one side of the school compound with the children on the other side of the schools they see big corporations and governments cutting down big forests and they see countries still burning fossil fuels so it tells us that we also need to use our voices to call on governments and big corporations and industries to step up and do what must be done to address the climate crisis so we cannot separate these two issues. So it sounds like on the broader level you've got educate yourself on the issues surrounding your community and how you can make a difference, support the local initiatives that are already there, and then also invest not only your time but money and energy into these initiatives. And then you mentioned two others which was planting trees and reducing plastic waste which are very easy accessible ways for people to support the environment. And through this conversation, it's really apparent that you do a lot and that it's incredibly pa- um, an incredible source of passion for you. Uh, so I wanted to know, how do you recharge? Like, how do you take the time to recharge and get up every day and choose to fight this battle? One of the ways I recharge is through why I'm doing the work I'm doing. Because many people ask me if I'm hopeful about certain things, if I'm hopeful about how leaders are responding, if I'm hopeful about how everyone is treating the environment. And I like to respond with the fact that I do not like to hope. Instead, I choose to lean on love, love for the planet, love for nature, love for the people around me. Because when you lean on the love, it's very unlikely that you will get to a point that you want to give up. Right. It will, you will always hold on to the fact that I'm doing this because of how I want this future to be. I'm doing this because 
I want to live in a livable world and I want a safe future for everyone and all of humanity. So when you lean on that, then it's something that keeps you going every day. And secondly, right now, as activists, there's a whole global community of young people who are in solidarity with one another. And so being able to support each other, even activists who are beyond the Kenyan borders, there's that solidarity among the young climate activist movement right now. And I think with that, when we meet together in person and everyone shares their challenges and acknowledges how difficult it is to do this work and the fact that we can all support each other, it's something that also keeps me recharged, just knowing that I'm not alone in this fight. There are so many others out there supporting and really also willing to be out there to stand up for what they believe in. And then lastly, I also still recharge myself out in nature. I'm one of the most adventurous person. So if I'm not out on activism or doing the work with communities and the children, then you will still find me somewhere out in nature, yeah. in a place where I can have fun in nature, just listen to the trees and have some fun out in nature. And I think this brings back my energy and then I'm able to keep going every time. That's really nice. And you started off by talking about love in the beginning of this conversation when you were talking uh, to the COP26 group and saying to keep an open heart. So I think that's that's really nice. And uh, um, it's been really nice to have you here. What I want to know is uh, where can people follow you and support your work if uh, they're so interested? Yes, I really do a lot of advocacy on social media. So if you check my social media sites, they're all at Liz Watuti, that's mm-hmm. on Instagram and on Twitter, and also on Facebook, Elizabeth Watuti. You'll find my pages, and also you can check out the website at Green Generation Initiative, which is www.greengenerationinitiative.org, and the handles for the initiative are at GGI underscore Kenya for all of them, and That way you'll be able to connect and learn more and be inspired more to also take up action. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, All the best with the Green Regeneration Initiative and have a very happy Earth Day. Thank you so much and happy update to everyone. Thank you.